So here we are. The most fantastic general election result for the Green Party ever. We have gone from one to four MPs. We have fulfilled our objective, our strategic objective. It's not often you have an electoral strategy and you fully succeed in implementing it. Let's imagine that we do the same thing at the next general election. We go from four to 16. That would be, oh, wow, so, so good. Imagine at the next general election after that, we do the same again. We go from 16 to 64. My God, fantastic. Not just four Caroline Lucases, but 64 Caroline Lucases by that point. And by that point, it will be the 2030s, and the so-called critical decade for climate will be at an end, and we will still have less MPs than the Lib Dems do now. Right? That, that is the basic wake-up call. We have done absolutely brilliantly, and we are still sort of nowhere, because how much power do the Lib Dems have now? Well, essentially none, right? So, what are we to do with this situation? Now, some of you will know me as one of the people who helped to launch Extinction Rebellion, and, and we brought an idea onto the stage through Extinction Rebellion, which was extremely important and has, and will, I think, outlast Extinction Rebellion, however long <laughs> Extinction Rebellion goes on for. And that idea was Extinction Rebellion's first demand, tell the truth. And it's kind of happened, right? Quite a lot of truth has been told since 2019 that wasn't told before then. And what I'm trying to do is to extend that logic further, trusting that in these extremely difficult times, in these times which are, among other things, times of grave distrust of politicians and public figures and everybody, if you can come across as truthful, as authentic, in the way that we did in XR, in the way that Greta did, in the way that many green politicians do, that is an immense power. It's kind of a superpower, right? And we must make the most of it. But telling the truth begins at home. Telling the truth isn't just about, we've got to tell the truth about the climate science, right? No, it's got to be the truth about everything, including the truth about where we actually are and where we're actually going to get to. So, here's a very difficult truth. If the Green Party does absolutely superbly at the next two general elections, we may still be just as far away from power as we are now in a decade where we will almost certainly, almost, almost, almost certainly have missed all the targets that are in the IPCC documents, etc., etc. I mean, we've basically already missed them now, folks, right? Just in case anyone is still kind of holding on to any silly hopium, 1.5 degrees is dead. The safe limit that was given to us in the Paris Agreement We've already gone through it. And if any of you are thinking, if you've been reading someone silly like Michael Mann and thinking, uh, oh, wait, it's not technically, we haven't technically passed 1.5 degrees because it has to be for several years that you're beyond it before you've actually technically passed it, right? A sane way of, of measuring whether one has passed 1.5 degrees or not is to say something like this. You've got to take the average of the last few years and the next few years according to current trend lines and according to current trend lines, we are already past 1.5 degrees on that measure, right? So, we are in serious, serious trouble, and this is just climate, right? I talked in the last session about AI and other existential threats. Even just on climate, we are absolutely thigh-high in the doo-doo uh, at, at this point. And we need to be honest about that, because it makes a difference to what we decide to do and what we decide to prioritise. But how do we spend the time that we have? How do we spend the platform that we have? How do we spend the energy that we have? These things are not, are not renewable resources entirely, right? So what do I th how do I think we should spend that time and energy and so forth? The Green Party has an extraordinary power, whether or not we are in power. And that power is that in the electoral space, we are the closest there is to a trusted voice on climate and nature. Right? Ordinary electors, whether or not they vote for the Green Party, know that the Greens are the ones who really care about that stuff. Yeah? And what they hear is the Greens saying, we're going to take action on this, things are, things are bad, we're going to make them better, etc. But what if we don't have the actual power to make them better? What if the most powerful thing that we can do is to confess that we're a bit fucked? Right? 
What if we break the taboo that politicians always observe of saying, vote for us and we'll make everything fine, right? What if we were brave enough to actually stand up and say, you know what, the Green Party was formed with the agenda of being the electoral arm of the environmental movement. We are finally getting somewhere with that agenda. But to some degree, very important, to some degree, it is too late. It is too late for some things. It is too late to stay below 1.5 degrees. It is too late for there to be a smooth, orderly green transition. It is too late for us to hope that there aren't going to be immense disruptions now, terrible, unprecedented climate disasters. These things have only just begun. What if the Greens were big enough to stand up and confess all of that and to say the objective, the hope that was at the core of the foundation of the Green Party has not been fulfilled? We wanted, when we were, some of us here, not me, but some, a few people in the room are old enough to have been around when the Green Party was actually formed and to have even maybe been involved. And the Green Party said, if you support us and the rest of the Green Movement, then we may be able to keep humanity safe. What if the Green Party was able to stand up and have the bravery and the guts and the balls to say, well, we now can't keep, the, keep you safe because it's been left too late. You know, you wanted to keep, keep yourself safe, but actually you had to vote for us like 30, 40 years ago, right? And voting for us now, that's great, but don't be under the illusion that it's going to make everything okay. Things are not okay, and they are never going to be okay again. That is what I think the Green Party should do now. The immense power that Greens have in this terrible situation is to call it, is to tell the truth that we are waist high in the doo-doo, and we're only going to get deeper, yeah? Are we going to be brave enough to do that? Probably not, but we should. We should. And here's something which goes along with that, and we could start doing this even if we're not quite brave enough to stand up and say, you know what, we've kind of failed. And if you vote green in the future, it's not going to make everything okay. Here's something we could do which would be a really good second best to that and would be a compliment to it. We could start taking really seriously the agenda of resilience, of adaptation, of preparedness. We could start saying, and we have started saying this a bit. If you listen to Adrian Ramsey, he started saying this a bit, for example. We're in deep trouble, folks. You want to know who to trust when you're in deep trouble? Trust the people who've been telling you that we were in uh, deep trouble and that we were going to be in deep trouble, even deeper trouble, if you didn't trust us with, uh, with power at this point. In the climate disasters that are going to roll towards us and in some cases roll over us in the years to come, we, the Greens, actually have the best ideas about how to handle these things. We've been thinking about it for a long time. The ideal scenario is we stand up and say... The hope that was vested in us when we were formed is no longer possible to fulfill. And in that sense, there is a failure that needs to be admitted. That recognition of a kind of powerlessness that we now have, even if we continue to go up in our number of MPs, to resolve the situation would be incredibly powerful. But whether or not we're brave enough to do that, there is something closely related to it which we can do, which is to say, we're getting into serious trouble the trouble is only going to get worse. Trust us to deal with it. Adaptation, climate adaptation, should be put now at the centre of everything that Greens do and say and believe. Right? Because this is going to be a huge wave of the future. So much of what we've said so far on the climate has been mitigate greenhouse gas reductions. We've got to try to tackle the problem at source. And of course that never goes away. Of course that's still as important as it's ever been. But it is too late now. For that to be the only thing that we emphasise, for, for us to put all our eggs in that basket, we need to part, start, start putting more and more eggs in the basket of transformative uh, adaptation, of saying the wave of the future is going to be coping with the impacts that are coming at us. And this is something that Greens are hugely qualified to do. And a nice thing about adaptation and about adaptation centrism, if you will, in this sense, i.e. having a central focus uh, on, uh, on adaptation is that it's something that everyone can get involved with, right? It's the kind of territory of the transition towns movement and Incredible Edible and loads of other things that probably lots of you are involved with, but also lots of people who are not political 
are involved with those things too. So this is my kind of secondary connected uh, pitch here this afternoon. Greens must now, at minimum, at minimum, be brave enough to say, for example, the government are talking about doing a lot more on clean energy. That's great. But that's only half of the picture. And increasingly, it's not going to be the half that preoccupies people most. Where is their national adaptation plan? Where is their effort to engender a people's plan for climate resilience? Where is the huge fund ready to deal with the enormous uh, climate disasters that are coming at us? Where is their plan to actually get serious about leveraging the power of insurance in relation to all of this? Where is their plan to take care of all the people who are going to be deprived of insurance in the next few years? This is coming very, very soon to this country. Lots and lots of people not being able to insure their houses, right? Labour are nowhere on any of this. Greens could own this territory. It would be powerful. It is essential. It would unleash a new wave of seriousness of climate action and a new wave of awareness, right? Because when, you, when ordinary people, people who are not the kind of people who are probably likely to have turned up to this meeting today, you always got to remember very, very important how weird we are, right? If you come to a meeting like this, you're very unusual. Great, but unusual. Uh, right? Ordinary quotidian people when they think about climate, they hear us talking about, oh, well, 2050 and net zero mitigation, colourless, odourless gas, very important to reduce it. It's all very remote. I'll tell you what's not remote is water coming in your front door, right? That's not, that's not remote at all. The more we centre climate adaptation, climate resilience building, climate preparedness, the more we will wake people up and get them to realise, oh, my God, it's here, it's getting worse, it's real. It's not some future abstract thing. It's not about other people. It's about, it's about us. And if you say to me, well, yes, but most people haven't actually been affected. Yeah, that's true. More and more are being affected all the time. But, more, but virtually everybody at least now knows someone who has been affected. For example, here's a little example. Um, many of you, um, like me, will have uh, friends of, uh, of Pakistani origin. Everybody who is of Pakistani origin now has someone in their family who was flooded out back in Pakistan. Right? So anybody from the Pakistani diaspora is only one degree of separation away from dangerous climate change now because of those impacts. And that is one of many, many examples, and they're multiplying uh, all the time. So I'll move towards a conclusion and the, and the debate can begin. Well, part of what the debate will be about between John and myself as we talk more about how to respond to this situation is how much can this be a matter of, as I've been trying to describe it, mobilising more and more people? I run the Climate Majority Project. We are trying to get most people on side with action on this. Let me say something very briefly about why I think that's important. A crucial thing that many of us who are in Extinction Rebellion learned, is that this idea of, oh, if you get 3.5% active, then you're going to win, is an illusion. It's, it's not true. Even the person who said it, Erica Chenoweth, doesn't actually believe what's been attributed to her. She actually says, no, that 3.5% needs to be the tip of a much bigger iceberg, which needs to be at least 25% of the population. And what we say in the Climate Majority Project is, you need to get at least the kind of positive acquiescence involving involved in voting for the right thing if you're actually going to get uh, the kind of action that you need on it. There is no way of dealing with something as huge as this through techno-fixes or technocratic or purely elite solutions. Involving the elite is crucial. We do a lot of that work in the Climate Majority Project. I work with senior insurers. One of our um, main incubatees works with senior uh, corporate lawyers. We talk with senior politicians, senior civil servants, senior media people. You need to have those elites on side. You need to get more and more defectors from them. But unless you have active involvement from the majority as well, you are going to get sunk. You're going to get sunk in one way or another through, through protests or through being uh, voted uh, out of office or whatever it is. Look at the Arab Spring. Uh, what happened in the Arab Spring? People said, oh, there could never be revolutions in the Arab world. Those people are under the sun. They've got, those dictators have serious power over them. It'll, ne it'll never happen. And they were all wrong. Right? What the Arab Spring proved is, if you have a population who are deeply discontented, <laughs> even if you have a really seemingly effective authoritarian regime, sooner or later it's going to go under. 
people might say, oh, yes, but OK, but we've well, still got China, right? The Chinese government, they've got an absolutely iron grip. The Chinese government are terrified of their own people, right? That is why, for example, they banned the showing, in effect, banned the showing of Avatar in China. Incredible facts, right? They banned the showing of Avatar in ordinary cinemas in China. Why? Because they were afraid it would ignite land revolts. Right? They are terrified of their own people. They think they have to keep economic growth figures high so that their own people get satisfied. But then they are also becoming aware that their own people, their people are getting more and more dissatisfied because of the degree of air pollution in their cities. And they're like, oh, which of these things do we do? Which can give, which has priority? There is no government in the world that can afford to ignore the will of its citizens, not even the Chinese. Right? This is a basic sort of... This is a basic way in which democracy prevails everywhere. So we need to have a way forward which effectively involves elites and the majority. And if we do not, we will be overturned. We will be stopped in our tracks in the kind of way that happened eventually to Extinction Rebellion and even more so to Just Stop Oil. So my pitch to you here today is we have an unbelievably difficult task before us, the odds are absolutely stacked against us. We have to make a good faith endeavour to involve the majority and get the majority, to some degree at least, actively on side. Unless we succeed in doing that, we will not get the transformation that we are after. If you believe that, then I would urge you to get involved with the Climate Majority Project. Go on our website, register, etc. If you believe that, I would urge you to argue for that and to get involved in whatever way, wherever that is in your life, with, among other things, crucially, projects involved in the space of adaptation, resilience and preparedness for the reasons that I gave, and, and often this can be the same thing, ways of talking about and manifesting and acting on the situation which are truthful about that situation and which build the sense of the, that the population can have of trust in the people who are telling them the truth about how bad the situation is. And that takes me back to where I started. The truly powerful thing, the really awesome thing, would be if, if Green Party leaders and Green Party MPs and Green Party councillors and Green Party activists, if all of us were to increasingly say, not just, you know what, we've got to take adaptation deeply serious now, seriously now, it cannot be avoided. But if we were to say it, if we were to add to that, and part of the reason why is that we need to be clear, folks. We are deep in the danger zone, and we in the Green Party are going to fess up. We have been unable to do, and I don't know about you, but I feel very emotional when I say this, we have been unable to do the thing we longed to do, to get into power by 1990 or at least 2020 or 2000, you know, to not just have four MPs at a time when we are absolutely up against it. But that is where we are. We need to be honest about it. We need to tell the truth. If we do, it will be immensely powerful. And it always starts with you. Thank you. Thank you.